Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, we're going to begin this morning where we left off last week. We're in Revelation. And what's interesting right now is as we talk about heaven, which is where we started last week, but it's so much that we have to continue. It's under construction as we speak, as we talk about it right now. In John 14, verses 1 through 6, and I use the Amplified Bible because of its beautiful description. Jesus comforts his disciples at this point. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe confidently in God and trust in him. Have faith. Hold on to it. Rely on it. Keep going and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would not have told you, because I am going to prepare a place for you. That's where he says he's leaving them shortly to prepare a place. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again, and I will take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. And to the place where I am going, you know the way. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth and the real life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So there we find a huge change in things. He's leaving them. He's going to send the Comforter. That's the Holy Spirit. But at this particular point, he's explaining that he's going to prepare a place for us. As we read today, we're going to hear about this place. Revelation 21, 15 and 16. The angel who talked with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square as long as it is wide. Now the angel measures the city for John and gives him the specific facts about it. He emphasizes that this literal city is not simply an allegory of some spiritual reality. The city plan has a footprint. It's a tetragon, a square with four equal corners and all four sides of the same length. It's also the same height as its width and its length. So it's a giant cube. He goes on to say, he measured the city with the rod and found it to be 12,000 stadia in length and as wide and as high as it is long. Now, 12,000 stadia breaks down to about 1,400 miles. So picture a city 1,400 miles wide, 1,400 miles long, and 1,400 miles high. This is a projected cube that he's going to bring here. And we say to ourselves, well, who is it for? Well, it's for all those that were saved from the very beginning of time till the end of time here on earth as we know it. And you say to yourself, my God, that's, that's millions and billions and billions of people. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's those that are saved. Those that come every Sunday to a church and park themselves for a half hour, 45 minutes, leave and go back to who they were, they're not going to be saved. They haven't given their life over to Christ. They're not part of those that will be saved. Does it mean that they can't still become that? We pray for those people. God tells us to pray for our enemies. So we should be praying for everyone. 
that needs to be saved. But many, as the Bible says, the road to the lost is wide. It's a super highway. And the path to Christ and to the Father is very narrow and small. It is projected that given the current population on the earth and assuming the soon return of the Lord, the New Jerusalem would have to accommodate around 20 billion persons. Now these are theologians that have looked at the storyline of religion and what we call religion. Although Christ doesn't want us to look at it as religion, he wants it to be a personal relationship with him, they can assume a certain number. So they're assuming about 20 million are going to have to fit in this, excuse me, billion are going to have to fit in this cube. It is assumed that only about 25% of the space would be devoted to housing. Laid out on the top of the U.S., it would cover California, Oregon, Washington State, Montana, North and South Dakota, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, Texas, Oklahoma, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Kansas, Wyoming, Idaho, Nebraska, and Missouri. Now, notice we stayed with the West Coast where you got big states. We didn't cover Rhode Island and New Jersey. I'd be here all day long reciting the states to you. That's a large footprint if you were to take how much area is being covered. The height of the city is hard to imagine. The city will protrude far out into the Earth's atmosphere, actually up into space. Satellites orbit the Earth at about 300 to 600 miles. But the new city will go up 1,400 miles. So you wouldn't see the top of it. On the clearest day, you wouldn't see the top of it. At night, you might see where it sits because you'd have that cubular shape blackened out against the stars. 1,400 miles high. Spaciousness in the New Jerusalem, will there be room to fit all the redeemed from the ages? Now, I'm going to give you information. I love this part. To me, this is exciting, all the little tidbits. The whole earth, based on the dimension of the present earth, size is 24,901 miles in circumference. That's around. That's a big chunk of space. 197 million square miles total. 57 and a half million square miles are actually land. The rest is water. So it's 0 0.0125 square miles per person. In other words, approximately eight acres per person on this earth. Now, the interesting part is, if you took everyone that lived in the United States and gave them a double-sized lot, it wouldn't eat up all of Texas. So sometimes we really don't assume space and how much room it actually takes up. I remember going back a ways. I designed my own house. And I found out from somebody that you're not going to get this approved in any way, shape, or form unless some architect who's got a little bit of pull has a signature on it. Then they'll actually read it, but since you're not an engineer and so forth, they're not going to accept it. So at the time, Louise and I had the print business. So we went to an architect that did a lot of work for us. He, you know, we printed for him constantly. And he took my plans and materialized them into blueprints. I was so pleased, a little kid, you know, opening up, it's mine, look at this. And then one Friday evening, we left the shop and went into the parking lot across the street from us, where there was ShopRite and, you know, big food store. And it was empty. There was very few in this area where we were. And I had a large chunk of chalk and I marked out the shape of it, distance perfectly on the ground. And I stood there and I was ready to cry. I was on the phone with him the next day. Are you crazy? 
that's not what I gave you. This is a house, not a garage. It looked so tiny. He said, just calm down. I did exactly what you did. I went according to your plans and there's nothing wrong with the size of it. It's that you drew it, the footprint, on a parking lot, which was huge. Nothing around you, nothing there. He said, when you see this in its correct form, when it's built, it'll be a whole lot different than you think. And I calmed myself down and I walked across the bedroom, which that area of the plant, and I said, wow, this walks pretty well. And I walked across the breadth of the house and the length of the house and it felt right, it just looked so wrong. And that's what we have here. How can we fit everyone if God made the earth and now he's just gonna bring a cube down on the earth, how is it gonna hold everyone? This is the New Jerusalem, 1,400 miles on each side, this way and this way. 1,960,000 square miles, almost 2 million square miles. Now we're talking an awful lot of space here. Remember the earth and its circumference and so forth. Taking that number, it's 2,744,000,000 cubic miles. Two and three quarter billion cubic miles inside of that cube. Total usable surface, if divided into levels of a thousand feet high, which would give us more than enough room to have a house three, four, five, six stories high. A thousand foot high levels would give us 7,392 levels. In other words, 14 billion, 488 million, 320,000 square miles when you took all those levels and spaced them out. 14 and a half billion square miles. Space available per person, 3.15 square miles or 2,000 acres per person. So this is not construction, like I said last week, that we're used to. When you ride over a little covered bridge in Pennsylvania over a stream, and then match that up to the Verrazano Narrows, there's a big difference. And that's the kind of jump we're talking about. What he's bringing for us to live on and to live in because remember, this is going to be his dwelling place also, is magnificent. Beyond what we can understand, the wall of the New Jerusalem, Revelation 21, verse 17, he measured its wall and it was 144 cubits thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. 144 cubits thick is about one, one cubit is about 18 inches, so we're talking about a wall 216 feet thick. Pretty massive. The material to build, Revelation 21:18. The wall was made of jasper in the city of pure gold, as pure as glass. Now, when I heard this the first time, I thought to myself, gold and then glass. So this must not mean the substance gold, but like glass, is it like gold light? Remember, this is God constructing. He doesn't have to make it substantial and solid. It can be as solid as light is. We're gonna have new bodies, bodies that could walk on light if he chose to do so. We're going to have to throw out everything we know right now as we enter a new life in heaven and here on earth, especially in the city he builds. 
we can only see what John put down here in Revelation and understand it from that perspective. It's beyond our imagination. Although we cannot be certain what Jasper is, most believe it's diamond. And if it's the description of diamond, if so, the wall is made of diamond, not decorated with diamonds, but made of diamond. Well, that's a good way to build a wall because when you think about it, diamonds are some of the strongest substances on the planet. They're unbelievably brutally strong. It's going to need to be to support all that size. But of course, the weight could be maybe nothing because God's in control. And we're not going to be living in the same four dimensions we live in right now. We're going beyond that. We're going to where God lives. We're walking through a wall as commonplace. So when it makes reference here to gates, this may be just an entrance area which old temples had, and they call the entrance area gates, but it wasn't a gate because there was no physical gate there. It was when you went from one area into another area, it was called going through a gate. Verse 11, valuable, excuse me, verse 21, 19 and 20, Revelation 21. The foundations of the city walls were decorated with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth ruby, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth turquoise, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Now, some of those are actual stones we know today, like an amethyst is a purple colored stone, quite attractive. We know what a diamond is, we know what a ruby is, we know what an emerald is. But basically, some of the other stones that are mentioned here, we have no idea what they are. So God's telling us it's much more than we can conceive. But I'll give you an idea related to. <clears throat> Jasper was a transparent gem of various colors, which could be quartz or diamond. Sapphire was blue, transparent, precious stone and could have been sapphire in stone itself, not just the blueness. Emerald, like our emerald today, is transparent, a green gemstone. Sardonyx may have been a semi-precious stone like an onyx. Now, I have a shower on my second floor that's the walls are onyx. It's gorgeous, it's many colors, in the stone itself, it's a, it's a beautiful, attractive stone. God's given us so many things that are unbelievable. And he gave us the ability to use these. <clears throat> when you see a diamond in its raw state, it's nowhere near what it looks like after it's been cut properly by a jeweler. And when you see many of the stones that are spoken of here, God's doing the cutting. He's supplying what's there. So. You're just going to be in awe looking at what's here. Chrysolite was yellow, like topaz or peridot. Beryl was the same as our aquamarine beryl or sea green colored precious stone. Topaz, bright yellow topaz. Topaz actually goes into the brown field also. Amethyst, beautiful purple. Jacinth, turquoise or aquamarine. These precious stones are all either transparent or translucent. So the foundations will also glow with the light of the city. These foundations will be brightly colorful and dramatic and will contrast with the clear, transparent walls that they support. I keep in mind with the transparent walls or translucent walls, the light of Christ, who is the light of the city, will spread throughout. This whole cube will glow as deep as you are in space to see this will glow magnificently all the time because Christ will be king and our savior for that thousand year millennial reign. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Remember there are three gates 
spread on each side of the city. Each gate bears the name of one of the tribes of Israel. Each gate has an angelic greeter, an angel at the gate. So it's not a closed door. It's a gate to the city with a greeter. We're going to get one for the front of the church. They will never be shut. They will probably be wide and high to facilitate a lot of traffic. Each of these great building gateways is made of a single humongous pearl. As you approach the gate, its two towering doorposts, its broad sill, and its lofty lentil reflect the pearl light from the city. As you pass in through the building, the gateway, its lustrous, silky smooth walls beckon you toward the city. Soft light is reflected from every surface all around you. The reflect Now, you know what a pearl looks like, and it has that ability to have such a soft smoothness to it just by looking at it. You can almost feel it through your eyes. You can feel that smoothness. Well, that will be reflecting all of those magnificent colors at the same time. Boy, that's, that's really some kind of... Like our big buildings today are steel and glass. Nothing against them. Some of them are unbelievable, but I think it lacks a whole lot in what the Lord's going to build for us. The great city of the city of pure gold as pure as transparent glass. That's the other half of that. Randy Alcorn gives this opinion. As we investigate the idea of golden streets further, there are some teachers and scholars who do not hold to the idea that heaven's golden streets are literal. However, by looking simply at the text, God has given us within the text the entirety of John's revelation. There seems to be no reason in doubt of it. However, our attention in eternity will hardly be focused on earthly treasures. While man pursues treasures like gold on earth, one day will simply be no more than a source of pavement for the believer in heaven. No matter how many precious jewels and materials make up the physical construction of heaven, nothing will ever be greater value than God who loves us and who died to save us. Henry Morris has this description of the approaching city. Though these pearl, through these pearly gates at many levels will pass for endless ages, streams of holy angels and glorified saints, that's us, going in and out of the business of the king. It's hard to imagine God of all eternity, our savior, the reason we're there is because he loved us so much. We'll be present there all the time. And you say to yourself, well, if this was some rock star, or some great athlete, wouldn't it be cool to go visit with him and sit down and talk with him, get his opinion on life? This is God. This is God. You're going to be able to go sit and talk with God. Oh, that's right. You can do that now. See what we take for granted? We can sit at any point or stand or lie down, whatever, and speak with God, your Redeemer, your Creator, the one that you want to drag all your problems to, the one who wants you to drag all your problems to him. He wants to know your life and be a part of it. He wants you to trust in him. He wants you to have faith in him. And when it gets tough, remember to have faith in something and it always works out great. Well, you know, that's not really faith. We just say words and, and, and it works out. But when you have to really ask and repeatedly ask because he says that, come to him with gratitude, love, respect, and repeatedly ask for what you need. And then sometimes to not get it because he knows it would be bad for you. Although you yourself think it'd be just what you need, he doesn't give it to you that way. You still 
have to have faith that what he held back from you was the right thing. That's having trust in God. That's who we become when we live in faith and we walk in faith. We don't know what leads us on the next step. Sometimes it's a doorway and when you open the door up and look out, it's total blackness. But you have to have faith you'll be okay. It's like going down into your basement, leaving the lights off at night so there's no light whatsoever, and trying to walk from one end to the other and back. Now, pretty much you're almost positive you're going to trip on something. And although in front of you could be 10 feet wide and not a single thing, you're going to walk like this, trying to feel your way through. When you trust in God, there's no feeling. You just take the step. You leave the rest to him. That's what faith in Christ is. That's why he says, you make it hard because your faith is so weak. But when you trust in God and know that even if I make the wrong step, he'll get me back on the path, it all of a sudden becomes a whole lot easier. Maybe not exactly what we want it to be every time, but our faith in Christ is what makes life worth living. We have to take that rule book he gave us and apply it. If not, we're just reading words. It's a comic book. When you apply it and live in faith that God watches over you and believe that he does, then you have a personal relationship. One can only picture, for example, the delightful homecoming of one of the king's servants, Revelation 22, verse 3, who has been dispatched on a mission of exploration and development in some distant galaxy. After a long absence, he begins a long journey earthward, traveling through space at angelic speeds, far greater than the velocity of light, Though still at some finite speed, he enters the Milky Way galaxy and soon approaches the solar system, slowly slowing down in order to better savor the, savor the beauty of Earth as he draws near to it. He soon sees the fair planet with its soft vistas of blue and green beckoning him. And then he sees the holy city. One would have to view it from a distance, of course, really to see its full grandeur. The city is far too large for one to see the whole of its beauty otherwise. From the outer reaches of the new heavens, however, he will be able to reveal, reveal its magnificence. The great city jasper walls glowing in the white and its softness yet shimmering hues with the jewel foundation imparted unimaginably beautiful rainbow colors along the lower reaches. The shining pearl entrances traversing its height and the intervals between found in the entire universe, welcoming home the trusted emissary of the mighty king. He made a beautiful story of what it would be like, but we're going to experience that. We're not going to be confined to the home that he built for us. We're not going to be confined to earth itself. Then there's no reason to rebuild the heavens. When it says that the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll and redone, it means that those heavens will be traversed by us. It's going to be like some of the space movies that we saw where people travel in great distances. In the movie Dune, they had people that would be able to move you from one spot in the universe to another spot through thought. It's not so far-fetched, not for God. If you chose to be here, and when we were done to that, I said, go have a wonderful week, and then you chose to be home, you'd be at home. There'd be no driving in between, you would be there. You're going to need to, because the heavens are still expanding in size. As I'm standing here talking, they don't stop traveling out into space at phenomenal speed. 
it's growing greater and greater and it will be redone greater so it's not being redone so we can just stare up and look at it anymore we'll be able to go to it throughout it and come back and see that cube glowing on this planet and this planet will be magnificent it'll be what god originally intended it to be plus the new heaven and the new earth the new city jerusalem Revelation 21 and 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. In the new Jerusalem, there will be no need for a temple. Both the Father and the Son and presumably the Holy Spirit will reside in the new Jerusalem. Their throne will be there, Revelation 12, 22, 21. All the reasons for having a temple in the past were a place to meet God, to meet with him, offer sacrifices for sins, a place to pray, a place to honor and praise and worship God. The human residents of the city will have direct personal access to all the persons of the Godhead, so no temple building will be needed. Hard to understand that. It's not like you get off the elevator and the old-fashioned way, the person running the elevator would tell you what was on each floor as you got there in big department stores. Can you imagine someone saying, Jesus Christ is on floor 21? For those of you that are going to be meeting with him today, the Father is on 56. Not something we ever thought of before. But that's what John experienced. He saw this. He didn't see inside the cube, though. See, he saw it. And that's why he was able to write it all down, not understanding what he saw. And the reason he didn't see inside is because what took place inside was beyond what we could understand. God speaks and thinks and acts and dwells beyond what we can understand. And isn't that wonderful? He's going to take us and bring our mental capability up closer to his level so he can truly rapport with us. So he doesn't have to hope that the person coming to see him thinks he is God. He doesn't have to prove it. Did you read the plaque on the wall where I graduated from? The only reason we're there is because we did believe in him. We did trust in him. We did put our life in his hands for that purpose. I've a few times in my life been in a situation where I could have died. More than a few times. Um, I'm a cat with nine lives, so to speak. And what I found amazing is because my faith was so worry that I was not with him and that he was not with me. I did not fear the dying portion of it. I had cut through my wrist. Chris and I was working. I think I've mentioned this before. And it cut through the ulnar nerve and artery and the blood poured out. I was three feet from my coach and it was shooting straight at the side of it and running down it. Chris was underneath me. I was trying to not let it hit all over him. And I was comfortable with telling him, go home, call mom, let her know what happened. She was at work at the time and call 911, get an ambulance here. I could think clearly and I was not afraid. I knew it was in God's hands. Then when I got to the hospital, we were concerned with knowing why was it that after cutting an artery, it had not bled me to death right there. And the doctor said every time one out of a million cases that the artery will close up at the end, even though it's pumping blood so hard. I was fine. I had unreal pain later on. And out of all the injuries I've ever done, this was the most painful because I had cut through that major nerve and I still don't have correct feeling in these fingers and so forth. But I was fine. I was in his hands. If I was supposed to go, I would go. 
Now, I'm not telling anyone to not apply this to COVID. Do what your intelligence tells you to do. But don't fear. It's the one thing you don't need to do, fear. You're not going to get anything that he doesn't plan on you having. He has you in his hands. He loves you. He will take care of you if you have faith in him. Without your faith in God, how can he possibly grant you that? These things that we read here and we apply, and we're not going to be able to finish this so much more, are things that we need to put in our life and lean on it. Have faith that he'll take care of you, your family members. I know many of us have relatives that we would love to see make it to heaven. And our great concern right now is they're the farthest place away from that. We know who they are and how they live their life and there's no connection to God. What's going to happen? Do you think God would make a mistake and not get your loved ones there if they're supposed to be? Not possible. He doesn't make mistakes. It's not part of his nature. He can't. Those that are to be will be. And he says, when we reach this point, when we're dead from here, but quite alive in heaven, we won't be concerned anymore. He's going to stop the pain and the sorrow and the suffering. We will have what he claims for us to have here. So we need to have faith in this God. Each one of us at different times in life have been in jammed up situations and seen ourselves walk away months later doing just perfectly well. And who do you thank for that, yourself? Or the God that watches over you so much? This is where we live. Times are tough out there. And they're going to get tougher before they get better. We're looking at a crazy, crazy year. We're a little over halfway through it, and it's getting crazier as we go. And it's an election year. Think of how crazy it's going to get. Think of the claims of right and wrong and who did this and who did that. You're going to hear to the point where you're so tired of it, you can't wait till it's over with. We will move on to the next step. We do have Christ to rely on, to get us through, to have faith in. He will carry us like he's carried this church and each one of us. So let's continue to thank God for the work that he's doing in us. Thank God for getting us here each Sunday and giving us as a family a chance to share together and worship him together. Let's do that now. Holy Father, we love you and praise you. We thank you for your word, which is such a blessing in our life. It gives us knowledge of where we're heading and how much we need to do. And that you're there with us. We're never alone. We're never by ourselves. So we ask you, Lord, at this time, please make our faith stronger. Take away the weaknesses we have as humans. And you know that we're weak. You built us and designed us so that we would need to lean on you. Help us to lean on you. Help us to turn to you first and foremost in all situations. And allow us to give the glory to you, to give it to your Father. We thank you in his holy and precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.